պրապխատ պատնայիկի ինդոյթիդան, մոգ մրդավտ լեկցիիտ։ Մե ծիրո ինպորմացի ես կետխույթ, պրապեսոր պատնայիկ իշեսախեպ, իսարիս էկոնոմիստի, ռոգործուկոյիտքոյիտքոյիտքոյիտքոյիտքոյիտքոյիտքոյիտքոյիտքոյիտքո� Ես կախլավտ շտատիս պավրովի սա կոնսուլտացի որկան, որ ամերից խովծլի որ եկոնոմիկ որ անգարի շեպս ամսադեպս, իս ասեվ է իկո ծայուրի կայերոս մեր շեքնիլի ոտղ կացիանի սամուշահությությությությությությությությությությությությությու դամսոպլիվ էկոնոմիկուրից այսրիկիս գարդակնիս պոտենցիալս է։ Պատնայիկի ավտորիը առայրդից նոբելից իգնիսը դաստատի իսամ աչորիսարի որիատաս թեքուս մեծ ելս կամությամ ուլից � Mr. Chairman, friends, first of course, I'm very grateful that I have been invited to this conference and asked to speak here. I'm afraid I don't have the competence to say anything on Georgia. I, what I have to say may not even have much direct bearing on Georgia. I hope it will have some indirect bearing. The fact that the period of neoliberal capitalism, by which I mean the phase of capitalism, which has been marked all over the world by the pursuit of neoliberal policies, policies which have seen relatively free movement of goods and capital, especially finance across borders, much freer than ever in the history of capitalism. The fact that this phase of neoliberal capitalism has been associated with growing inequality is well known. But it has also been associated with growing absolute hunger and what one may call nutritional poverty. I'll just give one figure. If you look at the average annual per capita cereal production in the world for the period 1979 to 81, I take the annual average centered on 1980, it was 355 kilograms. If you do the same calculation for the triennium centered on 2000, it was 343 kilograms. If you make the same calculation for the period triennium around 2016, then you get 344 kilograms. And of the last, a substantial amount of cereals has been used for ethanol production. So what is available for human consumption as cereal is much lower. Clearly, this suggests that the per capita absorption of cereals in the world has gone down quite significantly between 1980 and now. Normally, in a period in which world incomes are growing, per capita incomes are growing, the absorption of cereals should be increasing 
because this is not only what one directly consumes as cereals, this is cereals directly and indirectly consumed, indirectly through animal products into whom cereals go as feed grains and of course processed food. So if you look at the total cereal absorption per capita, it should be rising in a period in which world incomes are rising. The fact that this did not happen shows that there must have been a substantial squeeze on the real incomes of vast numbers of people because of which there was an increase in hunger and nutritional poverty. The squeeze on the incomes of vast numbers of people occurred both through a squeeze in the level of money incomes arising, for instance, from the fact that employment opportunities were restricted, but also because of the rise in cost of living, among other things, because of the privatization of essential services like education and healthcare which obviously means that less purchasing power is available to be spent on other goods, including even food grains. So you have the f this, this fact, namely, the entire period of neoliberal capitalism has been associated with a noticeable increase in nutritional poverty in the world. But in addition, the point which I want to make in the course of this talk is that this period of neoliberal capitalism has now run into a protracted, prolonged crisis. That, that I would say that neoliberal capitalism has come to a dead end, a cul-de-sac. Why has it come to a dead end? Basically, there are two reasons for it both arising from the nature of neoliberal capitalism itself. The first is that in the world economy, there is a tendency towards overproduction. There's a tendency towards what an economist would call, say, would call ex ante overproduction. That means other things remaining the same, there would be an overproduction because demand is shrinking. And the second factor is that when there is such a tendency towards overproduction, normally one would think that the states would intervene, increase expenditures, and therefore boost demand and overcome overproduction. But again, under neoliberal capitalism, such intervention by the state is not possible. The only offset, the only counteracting tendency to this tendency towards overproduction is the periodic formation of asset price bubbles. As you know, in the United States, there was the dot-com bubble in the 90s. There was the housing bubble earlier part of this century. The formation of such bubbles particularly in the world's largest capitalist economy, the United States, is the only counteracting tendency that is available under neoliberal capitalism to this tendency towards overproduction. But of course, you cannot have bubbles made to order. You cannot actually hold a gun to the heads of the speculators and say, start a bubble. Consequently, you find that the bubbles themselves are not always forthcoming, and when they do by chance arise, their collapse would plunge the system once more into a crisis. Therefore, my argument is that neoliberal capitalism has run into a period of protracted crisis. Why is there such a tendency towards overproduction? Throughout the world, you actually find that everywhere the real wage rate, or if you want to look at the working population more generally, not just wage earners, the real income 
of the working people, per capita income of the working people, is not increasing. It is more or less steady. If anything, it might even be going down. On the other hand, everywhere, take the world as a whole, within every country, and certainly in the world as a whole, productivity, labor productivity is rising. If labor productivity rises and the real wage rate or the, or the real income of the working people does not rise, that means the surplus, the proportion of surplus rises. That means there is a shift from the working people to the surplus earners taking the world as a whole. This happens within individual countries. This happens in the world as a whole. The question, therefore, would arise, and I, and, and I would argue, that a rise in the share of surplus, the shift in income distribution globally from the working people to the surplus earners is something which has a demand depressing effect. If you give a dollar to a worker, the worker is likely to spend the entire dollar. You give the dollar to a capitalist, the capitalist in order to spend the entire dollar. The capitalist would spend maybe a bit of it, part of it, and keep the rest unspent, perhaps to be spent on, at a later date, which is what we call saved. Therefore, out of unit income, the amount saved by the surplus earners is greater than by the wage earners. Therefore, every such shift of income, uh, every such change in income distribution has a demand depressing effect. It actually reduces world demand. The question that may, however, arise here is why is it that real wages are not rising? Here, let me go back a little into the history of capitalism. Historically, labor from the south was never allowed freely to migrate to the north. It still is not, as you know, the refugee problem in Europe and so on. Labor is not freely mobile across the globe. Labor from the south was never allowed to move to the north. Labor from India and China was allowed to move within the tropics they went to the West Indies, they went to Fiji, they went to parts of Africa, but not to the north, not to the advanced countries. Capital from the north, from the advanced countries, was of course free to move south, but actually for some reasons it did not. It moved to areas like mines, plantations, and such like, mineral resources, uh, raw materials, etc., but not really to locate manufacturing and other activities in the south, to take advantage of the low wages prevailing there for meeting global demand. That did not happen. If that had happened, then the distinction between the north and the south would have, would have disappeared. You would have found that the advanced country's capital, instead of being invested within the advanced capitalist world, would actually have got invested in the south, where the wages were lower, there were labor reserves which had been created because of colonial process of de-industrialization, where the local weavers and local handicraft producers were outcompeted by imported machine-made goods from the north. Therefore, labor reserves had got built up. Therefore, their wages were at a subsistence level. But these labor reserves remained unemployed or remained labor reserves. They did not attract much investment from the north in other activities than those which generally supported the colonial pattern of international division of labor. This meant a kind of segmentation of the world economy. There was one part of the world where wages remained at a subsistence level because they are huge labor reserves. There was another part of the world, namely the North, where wages rose more or less if not in tandem, but rose more or less alongside labor productivity. Therefore, you had a difference between wage rates that not only got established, but that grew for a very long time. What the current globalization, the current phase of capitalism, neoliberal capitalism has done, 
is to break this segmentation of the world economy, to desegment, I mean, to, 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 to cause a desegmentation of the world economy in the sense that now capital is moving to the south. In many countries of the south, we know about China, about South Asia, about Southeast Asia, and so on, to take advantage of the low wages there in order to locate plants for meeting global demand. Now, this has a very important implication. This means labor in the north is now competing against the labor reserves in the south. It is not surprising, therefore, <laughs> that real wages in the north are not rising. Stiglitz, Joseph Stiglitz, the economist uh, in New York, he made a calculation. According to it, if you look at the average real wage of a male American worker in 1968 and compare it to 2011, then you find that not only has it not increased, it has marginally declined. So you find that the real wage in the North is real wage rate is not increasing. What about the real wage rate in the South? After all, you'd find that if all kinds of activities are moving South, then there the labor reserves would be getting used up, and therefore the real wages there should be moving up. As a matter of fact, that is not happening. It's not happening because of another tendency that you find in neoliberal capitalism in this period of globalization. And that tendency is what Marx had called a, imposing a process of primitive accumulation of capital against petty producers, against peasants, against the small kind of, you know, uh, family-based enterprises and so on. The entire small-scale sector is being drastically squeezed, in particular peasant agriculture. Now this implies that many of them are moving to urban areas in search of employment. But the employment growth that is taking place, despite even high GDP growth rates, which is caused because of the relocation of activities from the north to the south, you find that the employment growth rate <coughs> is lower even than the natural rate of growth of the workforce, let alone absorb the displaced petty producers, peasants and so on, who are flocking to the cities. Therefore, labor reserves there continue to remain unabsorbed, keeping their wages low, and what is more, they also keep the wages of the northern workers low. As a result, the entire vector of real wages in the world economy continues to be more or less unchanged, continues to be more or less stagnant. But of course, labor productivity as under capitalism, including neoliberal capitalism, is growing everywhere because of which there is a, a, an increase in the share of surplus because of which there is also a tendency towards global overproduction. This tendency towards glo global overproduction could of course be checked if you could have larger state expenditures. Now let me just explain one very simple technical point here. Suppose the state <coughs> spends $100 more, but does so by taxing $100 from the workers then there is very little increase in demand because the workers would have spent these hundred demands any hundred dollars anyway. So you are simply shifting expenditure from one kind to another, no increase in overall expenditure or demand. There would be an increase in overall expenditure or demand if state expenditure, state spending is financed either by taxes on capitalists, because as I mentioned earlier, they don't spend all their income, so if you just take away $100 from them, their consumption or their spending would in fact go down by only 50, while the state would spend the 100, and as a result, total demand would increase by 50. So you find that either if state spending is financed by taxes on capitalists, 
or if it is financed by a fiscal deficit which is borrowing you don't tax anybody you simply borrow this amount and spend then there would be an increase in aggregate demand in the world economy now of course taxes and capitalists is disliked by all capitalists including by finance capital which is now globally mobile not surprising but finance capital also dislikes fiscal deficits which is why all over the world virtually with the exception of the united states you have legislation that fixes the size of the fiscal deficit relative to gdp in every country there is no economic argument absolutely no economic argument that actually suggests that in all circumstances the fiscal deficit as a proportion of gdp should be kept restricted not at all many circumstances yes if the economy is, is operating close to full employment but not otherwise thank you so 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 the point is that that the reason therefore lies not in sound economic theory but the reason lies in something else and i would say that something else consists in the fact that if the state directly stimulates demand through fiscal means and thereby raises employment then that delegitimizes the capitalist system because that amounts to admitting that the capitalists can't do their job well that the system left to itself generates huge unemployment and the state is required for this system and if so then why do we need the capitalists if it is required that the state must intervene to keep the system going then of course it delegitimizes the system itself and this is something which instinctively is felt particularly by finance capital therefore finance capital has always been opposed to fiscal deficits including in the 1920s always but this opposition is something which now becomes decisive because we live in a world in which the state is a nation state while finance is globalized as a result if some state does not do what finance wants then finance would just leave that state causing a huge financial crisis as a result states nation states are more or less compelled to act in a manner that the the term used in 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 media is keeping up investors confidence but that basically means keeping finance capital happy and therefore everywhere as i mentioned there is fiscal uh, legislation that limits the size of the fiscal deficit and everywhere therefore the capacity of the state to intervene in generating demand has gone down does not exist in other words the state simply cannot spend it can of course use monetary policy but we know monetary policy is basically very toothless in the united states in the wake of the 2008 crisis they brought interest rates down to zero and yet there was no stimulus to the economy and now many economists are actually talking about the fact that interest rate should be made negative in order to stimulate the economy you know interest rates cannot become negative in an economy using cash because obviously if the banks are going to give negative interest rates then the banks cannot give positive interest rates to depositors now if since holding cash gets me zero interest rate in an economy using cash you simply cannot have negative interest rate which is why there are many economists now who are actually saying the curse of cash that we must have a cashless economy so that monetary policy can charge negative interest rates but that's symptomatic of the fact that actually now interest rate policy or monetary policy is not enough fiscal policy is out in a world in which we have nation states and globalized finance of course if you had a world state if you actually had a state for the world as a whole or if you had coordination among nation states so that they could act in a coordinated manner they could act in unison 
In that case, since finance cannot migrate to the moon, you would find that it is possible for the state, such a global state or a surrogate world state, to actually generate aggregate demand globally. But there is not even any talk about it. There was, by the way, such a suggestion made during the 1930s Great Depression by a group of German trade unionists and also by this well-known economist John Maynard Keynes, but that was ruled out. Today, there is not even any talk about it. Therefore, the question of state intervention is simply out. Therefore, capitalism is now caught globally in a protracted crisis. Now, this is not often appreciated. Many people argue, for instance, that look at the United States, 4% unemployment rate, which is incredibly low, comparable to what had existed in the Kennedy years, which were generally called the golden age of capitalism. But you have had a very significant decline in the participation rate of the workers. And that happens when, and that's called the discouraged worker effect. If it is the case that job prospects are not very bright, then many workers, in fact, do not even report themselves to be in the workforce. If you take the same worker participation rate today as had existed in 2008, just before the crisis began, then you'd find that in the US today, the unemployment rate is 8%, not 4 as is officially claimed. And 8% unemployment rate is, is a very substantial, and this is completely based on official data. I've calculated based on official data. So, world capitalism is caught in a protracted crisis from which there is no easy exits and this is something which, as, as I said, arises for structural reasons, namely growing inequality, which has been talked about by many, including Piketty and others, but which also has this demand depressing effect, which not many have, have, have talked about, but therefore creates a tendency towards overproduction. And there are no counteracting tendencies. The only counteracting tendency possibly that can be there is asset price bubbles, and these cannot be made to order. Now, the fact that the world capitalist economy is caught in this protracted crisis has a number of implications. The first implication is that henceforth, in fact, we have been having this for some time, but, but, but even more in the coming years, the world economies in the world would generally be experiencing much higher rates of unemployment. This is something which, as I said, you find in the United States, 8% unemployment rate now. This is something you find in Europe. This is something you find in Georgia, that you actually have high unemployment rates persisting. And these unemployment rates would be higher than was the case even in the 90s or the early years of this century when you had the various bubbles or compared of course to the golden age of capitalism which is something which was post-war period right until the late 60s uh, or early 70s during that period of course unemployment rates were extremely low uh, in britain where, you know i was a student there the unemployment rate was less than two percent in the United States, in the Kennedy period, as I said, 4%. So really, by historical standards, capitalism never had such low unemployment rates. That's because of the state intervention through spending in what was called demand management. That is out as a result that there are no counteracting factors. So unemployment rates are going to be much higher now on. The second implication of this is that uh, you know, the, the, the model of export-led growth, which was practiced successfully in East Asia, in China, in Southeast Asia, and in South Asia as well in the more recent years, that model has run out of steam because export-led growth is possible only if you can have substantial increases in exports. But if the world economy is stagnant, and of course, if you have that within that stagnant world economy, now the United States 
is resorting to protectionism, then of course the prospects of the third world countries growing through export-led growth are something which are greatly reduced. The United States protectionism, incidentally, is something which is a reflection of neoliberal capitalism being at a dead end. Why? Because protection, which means that I actually stop buying goods from outside, of course goes against the tenets of neoliberalism, but protection amounts to what is called a beggar my neighbor policy, that I try to become better by making my neighbor poorer, because it amounts to exporting unemployment. If the US does not take $100 worth of goods from China and produces those $100 worth of goods, it is generating employment domestically, but it is killing employment in China. So protectionism is in fact something which amounts to exporting unemployment. It would work only if those countries to whom you export unemployment remain quiet about it. But if they retaliate, by themselves protecting against your goods, then you'd have a protectionist war, a trade war, because of which you find that even investment in the world economy would go down because the capitalist desire to invest would go down in a world in which is a trade war, which would of course be worse for all concerned. Therefore, you find that this protectionism by the US, which is a beggar my neighbor policy, is not a solution to the crisis. On the other hand, it actually shows the magnitude of the crisis. The fact that even the United States, the strongest capitalist country, now is violating the rules of the neoliberal game is something which shows that neoliberal capitalism has reached a kind of dead end, as I said. So you are now going to find that the prospects of export-led growth are actually going to be much less. If so, then third world countries we have to, would have to think in terms of alternative strategies of growth and this would necessarily have to be based on their home market, on their domestic market. Obviously, for small countries, this creates problems. They would have to team up with other countries in order to generate a large enough market. But for large countries like China, India, and so on, Indonesia, Bangladesh, you would perhaps now be, if you want to maintain your growth rate and so on, much more interested, much more uh, uh, required to expand your home market. An expansion of the home market would require, first of all, enlarging your peasant agriculture sector, because that, as I said, has been drastically squeezed and hurt during the neoliberal period. Therefore, an alternative strategy would be to promote agricultural growth based on peasant agriculture, increase peasants' incomes, in which case there would be a larger demand for other sectors, including for manufacturing. Secondly, the inequalities which have become very, very sharp, they have to be brought down. Reduction in inequality is an essential condition for enlarging the size of the home market. Both these, of course, would require substantial retreat from the kind of economic policies and economic strategies which have been getting pursued over the last several years. They would mean a withdrawal from the regime of neoliberalism. It's not going to be easy, as I'm going to argue later, but on the other hand, this is something which is essential. The third thing, the third implication is that countries which have got balance of payments problems, which have got big current account deficits. You see, these current account deficits were being filled through the inflow of foreign capital. Georgia is in a position where inflow of direct foreign investment is very large and has been meet, meeting the current account deficit. But for most other countries, it's not so much direct foreign investment, but finance, that is portfolio investment which has been coming in. And of course, finance is speculative. Because of Trump's protectionism, there is a general air of uncertainty about the world economy. And whenever there is uncertainty, finance tends to withdraw to its home base, which is the United States. The amazing thing is that in 2008, 
when you had the collapse of the housing boom, the collapse happened in the United States. The United States financial system was the most challenged. But from all over the world, for a certain period, we actually had finance moving into the United States. Why? Because whenever you feel nervous, you move to the United States if you're finance, even though that may be the location of the crisis, because everybody is confident that U.S. Uh, capitalism is, I mean, is, is, U.S. is the home base of capitalism. Therefore, you actually find there's a tendency for finance even now to move to the U.S., not steadily, but, but there are bursts of such movement. And to the extent that happens, it becomes difficult for many countries with current account deficits, countries in the third world, to finance their deficits. And of course, if they can't, then their currency falls. And they were, when their currency falls, their import costs increase. These get passed on in the form of higher prices. Inflation accelerates. And as a result, you find the working people suffering on account of this. So, so you are going to have this kind of situation which would be one way in which international agencies would prevent third world countries from developing the home market because any such attempt would mean outflow of finance and if you are caught in that unless you put capital controls you'd have to go to the IMF and when you go to the IMF that would demand that you actually reduce purchasing power in the hands of the people, which basically means that the same result which should have come about through inflation would now come about through squeezing their incomes, which is something which many countries have, have experienced, the so-called austerity. That is going to be the third implication. In other words, there is going to be a real tussle in the coming days between governments wanting to make changes at least to the neoliberal regime and imperialism by which I mean uh, that system where there is the hegemony of global finance really preventing it and doing so in very many ways. And the fourth thing which, which again we are noticing is of course the growth of fascistic forces all over the world. The growth of fascistic forces in my view is related to the phenomenon of neoliberal capitalism being caught in a crisis. Neoliberal capitalism for a very long time survived on the ideology of growth. That okay, you know, a, 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 a peasant may be getting squeezed, but the peasant had the hope that with high rates of growth, at least his child, if given some kind of training, is going to get a better job in future. But if that growth itself tends to disappear, then the ideological prop of neoliberal capitalism tends to disappear. When that happens, it requires some additional ideological prop. And supporting fascistic forces constitutes such an additional ideological prop. Why? Because as far as they are concerned, first of all, they change the discourse against, I mean, away from the conditions of people's lives to actually uh, an enemy, the so-called other, which could be a Muslim, which could be the Mexican, which could be an immigrant and so on, uh, which is something which, which so, so, so you, 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 you push the other as a hated object and therefore the whole discourse shifts. And what is more, the other is also blamed rather than the system for the people's distress, for their material deprivation and so on. Why are you poor? Because that immigrant is stealing your job. Why are you poor? Why are you unemployed? Because the Chinese are taking away your job and so on. So, so always there is this other which is responsible, not the system, not the functioning of the system, for the economic distress that people find themselves in. Then you find that there is invariably the projection of some kind of a muscular he-man who can actually get you out of this crisis. How he can get you out of it is something which is never specified, but on the other hand, there's a projection of a messiah, somebody who can actually deliver you from this situation by taking strong enough measures against the other. The other feature of, 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 of these is, of course, the combination 
of street level vigilantism together with state terror. It's, it's, it's not only state repression, but also street repression by all kinds of fascistic thugs and gangs and so on who go around terrorizing people, particularly those belonging to the hapless minority that has been designated as the other. But the most significant feature of, of these forces is that their rise is invariably supported by big business. In fact, fascist groups exist in every society. They are on the fringes of society. Depending on the situations, they might grow a little or they diminish a little and so on. But they, be, they come to the center stage and even occupy positions of office when they are backed by big business. And every fascistic group you can think of, which has actually come to power or has come center stage uh, looking for power, has been backed, has had the support of big business, because obviously big business in a period like this feels threatened and, and, and supports these fascistic groups in order to bring about this discourse shift that I have been talking about. There is, however, one basic difference between the upsurge of fascism in the 1930s and what is happening now. Uh, several basic differences. Uh, but one very basic difference is that the capacity of the fascist groups, even when they come to power, to overcome the crisis is non-existent because they too are operating within a world of globalized finance and the world of globalized finance finance capital does not want fiscal deficits in the 1930s a substantial amount of spending by japanese and, and german fascism is something that occurred by government borrowing but of course that is out now and consequently the capacity of even fascist governments to uh, get the economies over which they preside out of the crisis is limited. Precisely for that reason, the capacity of the fascist state to consolidate itself in its murderous incarnation as it had done in the 1930s is very limited because the ability of fascism in the 1930s to move to a fascist state very quickly was there because it was camouflaged by an improvement that was taking place in, in, in employment. Japanese economy was the first one that actually got rid of the Great Depression. Unemployment got reduced. Similarly, when Hitler came to power in 1933, through an armaments boom, unemployment got, got reduced. So much so that there was a period, brief period, between, say, 1933 in Germany and the actual onset of the Second World War, when actually he was quite popular because he had got rid of the unemployment and the horrors of the war had not yet visited the German people. So the capacity of fascism in the earlier period is not there now and as a result the capacity of it to move to a fascist state is something which is also limited. Because of which you are going to have not really a sudden murderous fascism but a lingering fascism that you know, you'd have these elements lingering as long as the neoliberal capitalism's crisis continues because they may get voted out. When they get voted out, someone else gets voted in. And if this someone else, unless does something about neoliberal capitalism and its crisis, would also get voted out. So you may have a period of, 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 of lingering fascistic forces. And of course, during this period of lingering fascist forces, they are also not going to burn themselves as earlier fascism had done through the war because obviously now we live in a world again. 1930s was a period in which there was rivalry among the different nations. Germany versus England, Germany versus France. Now we don't have such rivalry. On the contrary, globalized finance wants 
not the world to be divided up between different spheres of influence, but rather the entire world to be available for it to be moving around. And as a result, it does not want a world that is divided among big powers, as was the case earlier. So the capacity of, of, of contemporary fascism to burn itself through wars is something which is also not there. And therefore, you're going to have a period of lingering fascism, which of course is extremely dangerous because it poisons the whole society. The way out, therefore, is something which would, if you want to get rid of this fascism and so on, then you have to get rid of the very conjuncture that produces this fascism. This conjuncture being one of neoliberalism in crisis, it is, becomes then necessary to actually go beyond neoliberal capitalism. Now, this going beyond neoliberal capitalism is something which Obviously, then it becomes essential for the left to put forward an agenda for going beyond neoliberal capitalism. This agenda, of course, has to be worked out in the case of particular countries, uh, uh, you know, but so I, I, I don't want to talk too much about it. But obviously, for going beyond neoliberal capitalism, it again becomes essential to have, to mobilize the working people, the workers, peasants and so on, in order to bring about an alternative state, which can, uh, alternative government, which can actually uh, put forward this alternative agenda, project this alternative agenda, and move towards an alternative state that can fulfill this agenda. But it's not easy for a variety of reasons, because, and this is where I would come to imperialism. Firstly, of course, the moment any political formation puts forward an alternative agenda, if you have an alternative agenda, for instance, in the case of India, from where I come, the alternative agenda I would put forward is ensuring for every citizen a set of universal, justiciable economic rights. We had a talk on rights just now. Or, uh, among which I would just count five, right to food, right to employment, right to free universal publicly funded health care, right to free universal publicly funded education, and right to old age pension, decent old age pension and disability benefits. I made a calculation that if all these rights are actually granted, it wouldn't cost more than 9% of the GDP. And that is easily mobilizable, so that, you know, it's not, it's, 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 it's not asking for the moon. So, but that, for, for, for other countries, one has to work out other ways of actually working out such demands, which cannot be fulfilled within neoliberal capitalism, but which actually can be the starting point of a process of change for mobilizing people. Now, the moment you put forward any such demand, there would be capital flight from the country. Immediately, there would be capital flight. I mean, this is so serious. Uh, you know, in South Africa, when Nelson Mandela was about to come to power, a huge capital flight. And that capital flight was stopped by Nelson Mandela making, as his finance minister, the same person who had been the finance minister in the apartheid government. So that forces you to start with. Suppose you withstand this as you must, if, if you're serious, if you, if, if, if you can withstand it, in that case, at the next level, naturally, capital, even if it is controlled, can't go out, is not going to come in. So if you have trade deficit, how do you finance it? You'd have to have some trade controls. The US immediately would actually impose sanctions against you, which is going to make your life very difficult, because obviously you would be short of all kinds of essential goods. By the way, all these have been tried in Venezuela. Uh, suppose you still withstand this, then what they would do is economic warfare. You know, the Venezuelan electricity supply was just kind of knocked out. Uh, and economic warfare, and of course, if necessary, interventions in various different ways. Parliamentary coups, but parliamentary coups, today's news says parliamentary coup in Venezuela has been accompanied by literally a coup by the right, by the person who had declared himself to be the president in 
in lieu of Maduro, they have actually staged a coup. So, so, so you would have coups of that kind, and of course, uh, the last analysis, you would have imperialist intervention, direct military intervention. Therefore, there would be all kinds of efforts that would be made, but on the other hand, these efforts, nonetheless, would be accompanied by a substantial upsurge, as far as I can see, of the working people within the third world because they suffered not only from neoliberal capitalism, but now even more from the crisis of neoliberal capitalism. And that being the case, it is essential for the left to actually be in a position to lead the working people in this struggle. As a matter of fact, during the period of neoliberalism, politics was dead. Virtually every political formation had the same agenda. And you can't even blame them, because if you have a different agenda, in that case, you'd have capital flight, you'd actually get, get, get the economy into a mess, in which your own supporters, the very working people, the very poor, would be suffering. As a result, many got cold feet, and so they all more or less had exactly the same agenda. But now, precisely because of the crisis of neoliberal capitalism, there's also a revival of politics. In a sense, the very fact that the big business now has to resort to fascistic elements, support of the fascistic elements, shows the possibility of political interventions. The revival of politics, and I think all over the third world, it opens up possibilities for the left to go from here towards transcending neoliberal capitalism. Since neo transcending neoliberal capitalism amounts to ushering in socialism, of course, it is something that would lead to the ushering in of socialism. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very clear overarching view or adventure through the global capitalism and economic system. My question would be twofold, I guess, and I'll try to synthesize them. Um, as I hear you, implicit in your presentation is that the problem is political, not economic. So uh, basically we know what the solutions are, or at least we have a vague understanding of what the situation is in terms of economics, figures, and the um, uh, policies we need to sort of uh, undertake in order to tackle these global problems. But what we are lacking is a power, political power, and the political will to do that. So my uh, question will be um, concerning two aspects of this issue, one global and one local. Uh, in terms of global, I would agree that some kind of global, for example, um, undertaking to tackle this issue from the left is required. And maybe uh, if you know this kind of uh, attempt by uh, Yanis Varoufakis to sort, sort of create this global left initiative in order to juxtapose this uh, um, uh, uh, right-wing forces, up, upsurging right-wing right forces you so eloquently uh, alluded to. Uh, so one, one would be this global uh, uh, aspect of it, to take not necessarily like one single uh, state to create one single state that would sort of uh, imply many other questions like who is going to rule that state, what will be the system of ruling in that state, but to initiate this global uh, alliance of left, multinational alliance. And the second, what should the local governments like Georgia and maybe also in India can do? It? If I hear you correctly, we don't have much left but to uh, sort of uh, uh, oscillate in these margins to use these margins that this global capitalism left us for and to survive. Basically to obey but to utilize these margins and try to do better than somebody else. Thank you. You know, you, you don't really you don't really have an international trade union movement. You don't have an international working class movement. You don't have certainly any international peasant movement. So while the idea of a global left resistance is an extremely attractive idea, actually meaningful resistance would have to be done only at certain levels. 
let us say in India, you can have the possibility of a worker-peasant alliance, in which case the possibility of a change in the nature of the state, where the current state may be replaced by one which is based on the support of the workers and peasants. So we cannot wait for a global left coordinated resistance. That would be waiting forever. We have to, wherever the possibility of overthrowing this existing arrangement of neoliberal capitalism presents itself, we have to seize that opportunity. And consequently, the struggles would have to be done at the present moment uh, at the level of countries. Okay? Now, in the case of large countries, because they have fairly strong, diversified and diversifiable economies, you can resist imperialist pressure more easily and actually, uh, therefore, launch such a resistance. In the case of small countries, they would require to perhaps form larger groups, I mean, you know, along with other countries, in order to create that kind of a viable unit of resistance. I mean, I, I would not say about Georgia, but you see, one of the things, for instance, which I do not see why the European left does not raise, is the demand that European Union must enforce full employment in the entire EU region. You know, Europe can easily do this because Europe is not going to get into any balance of payments problems by doing that. Okay. So the opposition to it would come from capital. Now, I don't see why a pan-European working class movement cannot demand full employment in Europe and fight on the basis of that. I mean, that's just a thought. I, I, I don't know enough, but, but that is something which has always puzzled me. Maybe tomorrow when we are going to have uh, the, the talk by Costas, uh, we'll get more information on that. But, but the point is that this is something which is easily doable. Okay. What's the point of being in EU if we cannot actually demand that EU should have full employment? Okay. And when I say EU having full employment, what I mean is the following. Suppose there is an increase in demand in Germany. Okay. Since in Germany the level of unemployment is less, you would find that any increase in demand of that kind would then create demand in Greece. It will then create demand in Georgia and so on. So, 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 so you see, if there is an increase in demand in EU as a whole, then this is something which is going to create employment, particularly in the more distressed European economies. In, in the world everywhere, you've sort of assured us that this um, fascist state was no longer possible and you've mentioned lingering fascism i think that's a brilliant term but we're witnessing this lingering fascism in many places in the world right where we're seeing populist and very nationalistic movements on the rise in eastern europe in brazil i mean everywhere right and it seems like this notions of equality and justice are not really able to counter that like occupy movement i don't know where they are so what's um What's the response to that? Because we might say, okay, it's a lingering fascism, it's not possible, you know, that there will be some major, dramatic, killer state scenario, but still we're seeing that sort of these notions of equality, tolerance, non-discrimination, you know, all these good things that it seems like everybody was fighting for are suddenly, you know, giving way to this very dangerous rhetoric. You've mentioned the fear of the other, the villainization of the minorities. So I might have missed it from your presentation, but what do you think is the answer? Thank you. I believe the conditions for the emergence of these kinds of fascistic forces are three. The first, of course, there is a situation of crisis which imposes, imposes wide, widespread distress. Secondly, the liberal bourgeois establishment has no answer to it. And thirdly, that the left is weak. Not that the left is strong, but the left is weak. In fact, you know, Walter Benjamin's statement that all fascism is, is a sequel to a, a failed revolution 
is something that points in that direction. When you have a set of failed revolutions, the left has got weakened because of that. That was true also in the 30s. So, so the point is that I think the left everywhere in the world is weak today. I think the left's weakness is precisely, among other things, I mean, of course, the other things, collapse of Soviet Union, and for much of the people in the world, the Soviet Union represented the left. When it collapses, then they say, oh, well, you know, what you are talking about doesn't work. So, so, so there is that. But, but fundamentally, I think neoliberalism itself creates all kinds of hurdles on the way of the left. Firstly, it makes trade union movement very difficult because, after all, the left derives a lot of support from trade unions. It makes trade unions very difficult because any trade union action then leads to, 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 to capital investing somewhere else. And therefore, since you don't have coordinated trade union actions, you find that really that suppresses. The growth of unemployment during this period is, of course, the reserve army of labor. Then thirdly, also, you find that privatization weakens the trade unions because everywhere in the world, the proportion of the unionized workforce to the total workforce is higher in the public sector than in the private sector. In the United States, according to a figure I've come across, 33, and this includes education as well, 33% of public sector employees are unionized compared to only 7% of private sector employees. So, so privatization is a way of hitting at trade unions. And all this, of course, affects the left because it's a basic support base as far as the left is concerned. But additionally, I must say that one of the causes for the weakness of the left is that the left also, if I can put it strongly, has got hegemonized by neoliberalism. You know, that, that, that's a fact. Sorry, just to complete the answer I was giving. But, but I'm hoping that in the period of crisis of neoliberalism, the left would reconstitute itself and come up with demands and, and mobilize people in order to have an agenda that, neoliberal, that, that ultimately takes us out of neoliberalism. So I have great hopes for the future of the left. First of all, Mr. Patnaik, you're one of my intellectual heroes. Thank you for being here in Tbilisi again. So I hope my question will be indirectly related to your speech and directly to Georgia. So right now, Georgia is, I'd say, strengthening its economic ties to Europe, which, it, which means that basically uh, Georgian markets, and especially Georgian labor markets, are being expo exposed to European markets. So for example, there was this huge celebration of with the liberalization in, really see a, a process which made it easier for Georgian citizens to go into Europe and they stay there for three months. Right now, Georgian government is working with certain European governments to make it easier for Georgian citizens to work in France or Italy or Hungary or, or so on. For some reason, Georgian government is doing this. Uh, so what do you think uh, the effects of such exposure can, can be for a developing and small market like Georgia? What would be repercussions of that? You know, I, I mean, obviously, my knowledge of Georgia is very limited from what I have heard. You know, that, that, all right, until now, the Georgian economy was even going and, and, and signing free trade agreements with, with China and others. But you see, if you find that the growth rate of the world economy is slowing down, in that case, if Georgia remains an open economy, uh, basically willing to absorb all kinds of goods from other people in the hope that your exports are going to grow as well. Then in a period in which the world economy is slowing down, then your economy would be very adversely hit. Obviously, there'd be much greater unemployment, much larger current account deficit, more difficult to finance it, uh, depreciation of the currency, that would basically bring in the, uh, you know, austerity or alternatively inflation and so on. So, so, so I think, that a lot of the policy initiatives which have been taken here have been taken on the assumption that neoliberalism continues. 
that the heyday of neoliberalism is not over, while my whole purpose is to argue that I believe it is over. And in fact, you know, the very fact that George Bush has to go protectionist is in fact indicative of the changes which are taking place. So I think in this particular context, quite apart from the fact that neoliberalism generates inequality and, and poverty and so on, it is also something which no longer, in my view, really has a future. And I think that is something which has to be factored in, particularly for small countries, uh, like I mean, for, by, by, by all countries, and for small countries is the additional challenge of actually finding out the unit of resistance. How exactly do you resist? You see, China or India, being, being gigantic continental economies, can directly resist. Tomorrow, suppose you have a government supported by workers and peasants coming into India. In that case, that government can immediately do things because you can produce virtually every good uh, other than oil, which you should get from the Iranians anyway. So, violating U.S. sanctions. So, so, so the point is that you know, but. But small countries do have a problem. Small countries either then get together with other countries or at least pressurize to start with. I mean, I, I would have thought pressurize to start with this large grouping of EU to move in a different direction from where it is doing, you know, from, from what it is doing. Uh, but that is something on which my answers can only be very tentative and provisional. Eastern European countries have realized the limits of neoliberal embedding into Europe. Um, and current response is fascism, as you're saying, very, um, how do I say, like with its own limits. Um, and Georgia is one of those countries that stays hopeful, uh, right? Um, so, I mean, this is the situation where if you have any imagination of what could be a type of resistance, uh, would be helpful to voice. Besides that, what I wanted to ask you is two things. One is a very short, and um, I'm sorry for this question, it's just I truly do want to hear your response on, why do you think it's uh, entirely excluded that capitalism reinvents itself in non-neoliberal way? <laughs> Can you just uh, repeat that? Uh, I was asking, why do you think it is excluded that capitalism does manage to reinvent itself uh, into yet another kind of um, capitalism, not a neoliberal capitalism, but of another sort. I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful <laughs> it won't, uh, but I would want to hear your, uh, your imagination of it. And the second thing I would still ask you again to think, to, to, to um, talk to us about resistances as you understand and see, and where do you see those hopes? I mean, if we uh, think of uh, Wolfgang Streck, he would say, okay, capitalism has cle cleaned and killed its opponents, that's why the end is here. If we talk of Puravoy, who will be presenting here, he would say, well, unless uh, there is a counter movement, we will have environmental catastrophe. Um, but there are all sorts of transition discourses, uh, change discourses, movements. Um, in the global north, you have all this degrowth, community convivial economies. In global south, you have all sorts of post-development, etc. So I wanted to hear what is your attitudes about existing struggles and discourses. Okay. Uh, you know, the, firstly, I think Eastern Europe, you know, there was a rush from Eastern Europe to join the EU, partly because of the fact that, that you could actually have free movement of labor inside the EU. Any, incidentally, the, the, the opposition to free movement of labor is fundamentally antithetical to the theory of having a, a, a customs union, you know, because after all, if you have a common market or a customs union, in that case, the differential benefits of that can only be offset if you have free mobility of labor, because, okay, it is not a perfect substitute, but on the other hand, it is some way, it is some way of alleviating the distress in particular regions that may arise because of uh, you know, forming a common market. So the thing is that, you know, EU cannot survive if you do not have free mobility of labor. Okay. On the other hand, if you do have free mobility of labor, but unemployment, then you would have all these fascistic forces growing. 
you know. Uh, the way out, therefore, the left in Europe is substantially supportive of the EU. But if the left is supportive of the EU project, and it's, it's, it's hardly surprising because after all, this is a continent which had had two world wars. So, so the idea of having a, an EU is something which, of course, appears an extremely attractive idea. But then it becomes very important for the left to actually suggest ways in which EU can remain as EU and yet defeat the fascist forces. And one such thing would be to actually have EU level demand management so that there is, there is full employment in the EU region. There's a very strong correlation between unemployment and the growth of fascist forces. Uh, I, was, I was a student in Oxford and one of my teachers, one of my teachers was a very well known Hungarian economist called Thomas Balog. I don't know if you have heard of him. He was Lord Balog. He was a member of Harold Wilson's cabinet. He was a Hungarian Jew who had migrated to England, joined the Labour Party and so on. He was quite, he was quite anti-Marxist left, but he was social democratic. And he always used to say that, you know, if in Britain you have unemployment exceeding half a million, then you'd have fascification of the British society. That, and as, as a matter of fact, that's the kind of thing you are seeing now. I mean, UKIP and all these forces become powerful precisely because of the, uh, precisely because of the growth in, 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 uh, in unemployment. As a matter of fact, there is, you know, somebody, a person called Branko Milanovic, he is a Yugoslav, well, I suppose Serbian now, but Yugoslav economist. He made a calculation. You take between two, 1980 and today, and take the world's population, arranged according to bottom 10%, next 10%, next 10% in the base period, and find out how much their incomes have grown and you find that you get an elephant curve, namely that at the lower level increased very little. In the middle increased quite a lot and that is the Indian and the Chinese middle class which has done quite well out of globalization. Then it goes down and that is the European working class or the American working class, you see. So, so the point is that, you know, and that is a combination of both wages not rising, which I was talking about, and growing unemployment now. So I think, I, I, I think you know, that, 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 that I think within Europe generally, and particularly Eastern Europe, because they are facing this kind of resistance to migration, they should, of course, insist on migration, free migration, but at the same time, they should insist upon a pan-Europe level demand management policy that ensures full employment. All right. Now, uh, your point about capitalism, yeah, you know, I mean, look, nobody can say that capitalism is going to collapse of its own accord. Of course not. Nobody can say that capitalism left to itself is not going to find some way of doing it. What I'm saying is that in the current conjuncture, it has not come up with anything. What Trump has come up with is not a solution to the crisis of neoliberal capitalism. Okay, I'm not saying they'll never come up with, with any solution, but the point is this gives the left an opportunity to come before the people to take them forward. That's all I'm saying. Uh, then your point about uh, resistance. Okay, you know, as I said, that, that the contours of resistance would have to be uh, depending on the particular circumstances, particular situations. Uh, I can see, because I live in India, I, I work there, I can see the kind of contours of resistance which can get built up there, mobilize the peasants, try and form a worker-peasant alliance, push peasant demands to the forefront, something which is happening, and so on. And, and on the basis of that, uh, first, first, reverse the offensive of the ultra-right, of these Hindutva forces and so on, which in my view are fascistic forces, and then on the basis of that move forward by presenting new agendas and so on, you know. And in that process then the left can actually become more powerful, provided it is not hegemonized by neoliberalism.
Okay. Uh, but on the other hand, in other contexts, you have to work out exactly what should be done. And, and, and I would like to hear tomorrow exactly what in Georgia you are thinking should be the kind of program of advance. We saw the political and economic development of the political and economic development of Romelitz Uproda Upro Uaresteba, Ovalt Liurat, Mokolebulet has Ras at Motis Lidan Oriatas Slam, the Oritas Texmet Slam, the Albat Remdets, Ella Mimar Tulebi, that's a bully economic uri, global uri, social uri, politic uri, that's a shemdek, Quen Arsen has a memorz henet, Alebis. Aromat Eblobats, the I am Motsemulobashi, the Konasavi Arsenet Rosabobs Shansi, Glecheps, Dam Shromelep Shoris, Mortes, Gargoli, Alliances, Shekmatum, some Mes, Mines, Arut Sakartolos, context to what they have never told us pro, Ketros Nishnus Koshtaus, while the Mitam Rom, Indiad Mots, I'm dead Mots, what it was, yes, Indiad. Potential Gamots Rilebiari and Sadamian, a birum Aranai and Kadarchenis, Brzola, Shichabmu, Pireps, Memgonidum, Tulia, Gargoli, Mobilizabis Potentials, the Visabota Motsemolo Bashi, Asavak Apit, a neoliberal historic capitalism, Romelitz, Shemuichra, Transquer and Epshi, Transahlepshi, Social Rurtier to Bepshi, Trans Nerul System Ashitski, Uprodam Promet Sirces. Webs. I'm Tom. I am well. I'm well. Prisponze, my intercepts. Rogor Shaisleba Ramesi Medic Condes, Shaisleba Twen, as a gift governed Ara neoliberaluri capitalism is crisis tan, Aramet civilizatis crisis tan Rogorizaseti, globaluri civilizatis rule collapsed and a crisis tan. I'm not a chile by Sikos Shamtrovat Ramandeli systemist, Ram Saidan Gaut Ram. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I don't know I don't I Chuan gari be biwar thi mitom rom chuan is hazuga doba chuan ekonomika ve razar mo epsi migire bule bi sakonel suide chuan mawi khmat khod esk agar gamo ikhat eva magalitat katastrofol sabat to depisici romeli sakatulo zaus ta khod asse uli millioni arigans ko otkhmosi percenti a importi otsi percenti export tawari problema chuan ekonomika sesari chuan ekonomika struktura khod muzda tramati percenti dasak me bule bi sari sopus me urne ubashi romle bi tliani shida bordukis khod ra percenti azar mo epsi Problem as a way, sir, is from economic is tau, it's eta de dampinas and belly are commercial bank ebim. Telepinasuri system is what was at some of the percent the equipment, Armogan and commercial bank ebim, our cost, I must see a bank ebim, Romlevitz, Romelta, Dagger de Tevis, what was that percent, dam de Dahlobit, Mardeva imports. Shasabamis at Tower problem, Ratom at Sakatol, Ariam, Gachetilam, economical, Machin, economical structure ashi. I get to the Bully Cartuli, Holland, the Urida, Romans Gulis of Stras, Robert Otmotsi and Slepsi, Armochin, Holland, the Ashgazi, who was Bunebu Resursi, Amas Imis Magua, Remukum, the economic as a Gargat, Pig, Shiam Sira, Dasak, Mabada, Shiam Sira, Gaza, the import. Dahlo with Igive Rose, Sakatolo Shasulep, speed up with whole investitive. Robert's tweet, catastrophe, war of it is our balance. Romans are otmozi otse, is a zalim katastrophulish at the gi. Quick and arcotor deba, mitrom, clean and amvals, Romel Savach of the Pizit and Zarmoik Neba, Chen Wap, Chen Quiran, Apinaseps, PW School University, it's a bit the same habit. Eha Russian Gomeros is Holland Dur Dava Deba. Shemos Suli would hold University Sebit, Pinasteba, the Pizit, Rats Nishna Simas from Itzos Valutis Gam Arebas, Valutis Damasia oriented in Teleconomic Politica, Valutis Gam Arebaki, Isa Aya Pels imports. Tam tower to drama is like this. Aya pems imports the amit us pops economic is sector pems 
რომლებიც დამოკიდებულები არიან ექსპორტზე ანუ აძვირებს ექსპორტს იმპორტის გაიაფებით და მთელი ჩაკეტილი წრე ეხა ისეთ გლობალურ ეკონომიკაში სადაც ტარიფებზე უკვე აღარ ვინ აღარ ლაპარაკობს პრინციპში განვითარებად ქვეყნებში მონეტარული პოლიტიკა ანუ ვალუტის გაუფასურება რჩება ერთადერთ კარგ მექანიზმად იმისთვის რომ გაატარო ეროვნული ინტერესი ეროვნული ეკონომიკის ინტერესი ინდუსტრიის დაცვით ანუ ინდუსტრიის ვალუტის გაიაფებით ინდუსტრია სტიმულირდება იმ ვითარებაში როცა მთელი ეს ასე ვთქვათ გლობალური ეკონომიკა აწყობილი ამ ფინანსურ ინსტიტუტებზე რომლებიც ჩვენთან რომელზეც ვართ პრინციპში მიერთებული მთლიანად და მათი რეკომენდაციებით ვითარდებით მათი რეკომენდაციები კი ამის აბსოლუტად საპირისპიროა ანუ მათი რეკომენდაციები იწევს იმას რომ ჩვენ ჩავიკეთოთ ამ ასე ვთქვათ გაჭედილ წრეში ამ შემთხვევაში და თუ მაგალითად სახელმწიფო გადაუხეს პოლიტიკას ვთქვათ ხოლმე მარცხენები არიან თავრობაში და სახელმწიფო მოარი თქვა ამ ტიპის პოლიტიკაზე მან უნდა ეძიოს დაფინანსების სხვა წყაროები ხო რომლითაც უნდა დააკრედიტოს ამ წარმოების დაფინანსება ჩამიკითხო რა შემდგომარეობს ანუ რა არის გამოსავალი რითი შეგვიძლია დავახციოთ თავი ამ ჩაკეტილ წრეს რითაც თქვა რითაც რაღაც შეიძლება დავარქვათ ქართული ჰოლანდიური დაავადება როგორ გამოუძიოთ ამ ციკლიდან რომელიც იწვევს იმას რომ ჩვენ მოიხვართ ხოლმე იმპორტირებულ საქონელს და ვერ ვაწარმოებთ ადგილზე ვერაფერს და როგორ შეიძლება რა პოლიტიკური მექანიზმები არსებობს იმის რომ ჩვენ ალტერნატიული დაფინანსების წარმოები ვიპოვოთ გარდა პირდაპირ უცხოური ინვესტიციების მალობა მადლობა მათე კიდევ არის თუ არა კითხვები რომ მანიშნოთ თეორიული კითხვა მაქვს უფრო აა თუ კი ჩვენ იმ თეზის მივიღებთ რომ ეს ეგი კაპიტალიზმი ციკლურად ჭარბ წარმოებას წარმოშობს და სახელმწიფოს მუდმივად შეუძლია ამ ჭარბ წარმოების გადალახვა მაშინ მოკლედ ამ თეზის თუ მივიღებთ ჩვენ ვაღიარებთ სიმართლედ მაშინ გამოდის რომ მარქსისტულ პოლიტეკონომიას არ აქვს ახსნილი კაპიტალიზმის ისტორიულობა ანუ როდის დასრულდება კაპიტალიზმი ესე რომ თქვათ ანუ მეორე თეორია რომელიც ამას ეწინააღმდეგება ეს შეიძლება იყოს მოგების ნორმასთან დაკავშირებული თეორია რომელიც არ აღიარებს იმას რომ სახელმწიფოს მუდმივად შეუძლია ჭარბ წარმოების ეს დაძლევა ესე რომ თქვათ და მოგების ნორმა უფრო ცენტრალურ ცენტრალურ ელემენტად ყავს გამოყვანილი ვიდრე ჭარბ წარმო ციკლური ჭარბ წარმო ანუ ამასთან დაკავშირებით მაინტერესებს თქვენ რომელ თეორიას რას მე ვიხვდი უფრო მეტად ახლოს ხართ ესე რომ თქვათ ალბათ მე კეინსიანური მარქსიზმის თეორიულ ჩარჩოში რას რას ფიქრობთ აი მოგების ნორმის და ცემის ტენდენციაზე და დღევანდელ მდგომარეობაზე მსოფლიო ეკონომიკაში აი ამ კუთხით can you tell us can you share your uh, ideas about the way forward in terms in terms of economic theory what do you think about socialism and I, by socialism i don't mean soviet socialism and uh, maybe some variation of state capitalism by socialism first of all i would mean certain uh, uh, understanding of uh, different kind of ownership in the economic structure what do you think is it a way forward in future why why am i hopeful <laughs> you know i believe human beings are very intelligent they are not going to allow problems to remain forever as a result i think if we are precisely for reasons you say you say that we are now faced with a civilizational crisis now people are not going to remain forever stuck in a civilizational crisis and my hope arises precisely because of that you know that 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 you know that the fact that it has reached a flash point which is why we are calling it a crisis is something which is going to make all of us sit up take notice discuss come up with ways of taking mankind forward in other words the very fact of the crisis is what gives me hope okay um precisely the problems which you are discussing about georgia the fact that the trade balance is vastly negative the fact that you do not have uh investment banking and so on these are precisely what a georgian state which is let's say based on the support of the working people should be doing by the way these are things let us say which the post colonial indian state did 
a whole lot of third world countries after decolonization did precisely what, what you are saying, namely they put up tariffs, they protected domestic industrial production, they, uh, uh, they actually had very strict foreign exchange rationing. Okay. They uh, developed investment banking, they gave out very cheap subsidized long-term finance. The Japanese did it after, you know, the major state. So, so the point is, these are precisely the kind of things that a state which is based on the support of the workers and peasants in Georgia should be doing. The question is, I was talking on the unit, namely, perhaps Georgia may be too small to just do it on your own in the presence of massive opposition that imperialism is going to uh, uh, build up. So, so you, you would need a certain amount of uh, support, you would need a certain amount of, 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 of agreement with other countries, coordination and so on. But that is a part of the struggle itself, okay. In other words, the struggle itself must be one which actually tries to get an appropriate unit of, of, of struggle. But the, but the demands, but the demands are precisely the ones you are raising. You see, take the case of the Dutch disease. As a matter of fact, when North Sea gas was discovered, because the pound sterling appreciated, Britain had an 11% fall in manufacturing output because imports became cheaper. But that arises because the, foreign, because the exchange rate is allowed to go up. But you don't allow the exchange rate to go up in other words, why, why must we, in other words, these are problems within a neoliberal economy. The whole point about getting out of the neoliberal economy is to impose tariffs, is to control the exchange rate, is to develop investment banking, and is to undertake investment in all kinds of activities, and of course, to the extent that, that, that private capital is not here, the state does it. Okay. Again, in a lot of the post-colonial states in the, in, in the third world, one of the reasons that the public sector was built up is because there were no, there were no private capitalists. There were no private capitalists willing to undertake the risk of long gestation projects. As a matter of fact, steel plants in India were, there had been one private steel plant built in, built in 1912, but steel plants in India after independence were built up because of the state and likewise heavy engineering and all kinds of things. So same with Japan. Japan actually used the public sector and then sold off these to the capitalists as they emerged. But the point is that you know these are precisely the problems of development which many third world countries had faced earlier and which I think in Georgia, a, 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 a state that follows the current neoliberal state would be facing. And I think some lessons are to be learned from the post-colonial experience of a lot of the third world countries. Okay. Uh, then, uh, yes, uh, well, the Keynes or Marx. Uh, well, you know, uh, put it this way. I believe 70 years before Keynes, the basic propositions of Keynesian economics had been discovered by Marx when he rejected Say's law. I have actually written a book about it. It's called The Value of Money, <laughs> you know, in which I, I, I argue this. That, you know, that when Marx rejected Say's law, actually criticized Ricardo because of Ricardo's acceptance of, of Say's law. Why did he reject Say's law? Because he said in the CMC circuit, you can sell C for M, but you don't automatically turn M into C. You may hold on to M. And if people hold on to M, then there's a crisis. Now, holding on to M is the same as liquidity preference. Keynes' proposition that excessive liquidity preference gives rise to a problem of aggregate demand is exactly what Marx had said in terms of the CMC circuit. Except that, you know, Marx thought of it as, as, as a more or less cyclical. In other words, he did not see it as, as something which can 
which can actually afflict the capitalist economy for a long period of time. But there is no reason to believe why it can only be cyclical. You know, it can actually be, uh, the Great Depression lasted right until the Second World War. It was not just a cyclical crisis. And similarly, the current crisis is continuing. I, it's, it's not just cyclical. There may be small cycles within it, but on the other hand, the crisis continues. So, so I'm not kind of, you know, uh, I'm not kind of saying that Marx did not. But the point is, it is certainly true that because Marx saw it as basically Marx thought of it as a cyclical crisis, I think Marxists have tended to underplay the role of aggregate demand. Okay. But on the other hand, as you know, uh, the, the entire Keynesian theory was discovered very recently, before Keynes, by a Marxist who was the Polish economist Michal Kalecki. You know, he, he, and he had no training in economics. He started from Marxist capital. He was an engineer by training. So, so the point is that it is not that in this particular matter, there is necessarily any conflict between Marx and Keynes. Marx and Keynesianism, Keynes's own views are different. He thought you could stabilize capitalism. He was anti-left, he was anti-socialist. In fact, he wanted capitalist system to continue, but with state intervention, which again, Kaleski was very critical of. He wrote an article called Political Aspects of Full Employment, showing how it would be impossible for capitalism to, in fact, kind of, you know, stabilize itself close to full employment for a very long period of time, because in, in quotes, the workers would get out of hand because, you know, then they, then they would start demanding higher wages and so on. Yeah, socialism. Uh, yeah, what is my understanding of socialism? All right. I think that's a very important question. I see capitalism not only as an exploitative system. That, of course, it is. But I see capitalism as what I call a spontaneous system. By spontaneous system, what I mean is the following. Every economic agent participates in the capitalist system and is coerced to act in particular ways because of competition. Capital, a capitalist who does not accumulate would get outcompeted. So a capitalist accumulates not because he likes accumulating necessarily, but because of the fact that he's forced to. The capitalist, too, is actually alienated within the capitalist system. So it's a system of universal alienation where everybody is playing out a role which is forced upon the person because of your participating within the system. Okay. Now, my notion of socialism is where people, instead of being coerced to play out particular roles, actually become masters of their own destiny. Okay, so, so my notion of, <laughs> that's my notion of socialism, that people become masters of their own destiny and they can do so only collectively. Obviously, you cannot individually become a master of your own destiny. In a capitalist system, nobody is a master of your own destiny precisely because everybody is caught in this spontaneous system. The system acts on its own with individual actions, but those individual actions are forced by the position where the individual is. And when Marx saw this being broken, according to Marx, when you look at po poverty of philosophy and so on, workers are supposed to compete against one another. He says the combination is the first break in it. So he actually saw the, the spontaneity of capitalism being broken by the workers coming together. And then, of course, it, it, they, they develop class consciousness and so on. Anyway, so, so, so the whole idea of socialism for me is, a break, is, is to get out of the spontaneous system that is universally alienating to an alternative one where people collectively become masters of their own destiny.